Good morning and namaste. Uh, my name is Curtis Lightman, as has been mentioned. I'm the healthcare design lead uh, for ACOM India's healthcare team. I've been here for two years now working on some very exciting projects. Uh, you'll get a few sneak peeks on, on the two of them, uh, one of which is under construction at the moment, just up the road here in Cuttack at the SCB Medical College. Um, before coming to India two years ago, I had spent seven years in the Middle East uh, doing various large-scale healthcare projects uh, where we had a chance to try many new things, many new ideas that have been coming up. Uh, and then previously, before coming, going to the Middle East, I had worked in North America, in California, and uh, Minneapolis. So here we'll move forward. Uh, and that was a fine introduction. Thank you very much for this topic. Uh, trends in hospital design. There's been a lot of change, um, not only during my career, 25 years, um, but it seems to be accelerating. There's, there's more and more of it. Um, and to talk about that, every hospital changes over time, whatever it started out as many years ago, um, it, it's now likely quite different from wherever it was when it first began. Uh, I'm going to start off with a rather ugly slide. That's not a typical way to start a uh, talk here, but we've all seen hospitals like this. It may be 400, 500 beds, very impressive institution, grand with a lot of history, um, but it's, it's grown incrementally, organically over time. Um, and wherever, whoops, whoops, back, 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 there we go. Let's see if I can get the pointer here. Uh, and wherever it started, with this little piece here, they later add a wing, and then another wing, and then another wing. They fill in between the wings, and then they start expanding around the outside and around the back. And uh, this, so whatever started in, uh, say, around 1920, 100 years ago, now has gone on. But there, the original pieces are still there. And we all know exactly what those hospitals are like. Um, they're very frugal. They, they made sense at the time. Uh, but you know, there's, there's all kinds of load-bearing walls between pieces uh, that you have to work around and squeeze departments between. They also, uh, I can guarantee that none of the floors going from end to end align from era to era. There's lots of steps and stairs and ramps all the way through. Um, so getting, getting patients through and getting logistics and everything else uh, is very, very challenging in, in places like this. And we've all, we've all done work in these places. Uh, we've been designing these places, but uh, there's a, there, there are better ways. And over the past 20 years, we've really seen a lot of rethink and redo. This one happens to be in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, and after all of this, after 100 years, they, they bought 180 acres, plot of uh, farmland out by, the, out by the highway, and relocated the entire hospital. Clean slate. Um, and so we're seeing more of that. We're seeing significant expansions, uh, significant rethinking of campuses uh, uh, for healthcare. Moving along a little faster, here on the back side of this building, you can see the uh, buildings of different eras. Uh, you can see that 1920s building there and the 1960s next to it and maybe the 1990s uh, on the back side there. But this is what we're seeing a lot more of now. Uh, this is one just up the road. It's under construction at the moment. A new 2000 bed facility in, uh, at SCB. Uh, these may be green, you know, completely uh, green campuses, completely new start. Uh, or in some cases, there's significant uh, clearance that's required. But this is exactly what we're seeing all over the world. In Singapore, uh, 1,700 bed Senkang Hospital. Uh, this, is, this one's in Korea, Women's University Hospital. Doha, 400 bed uh, Women and Children's Hospital. Uh, Stanford University, uh, major expansion. 400 beds added to their already existing 500 bed campus. So what are these, what are the differences that we're seeing over time? Um, we're seeing all kinds of things and, but also, so budget um, we're seeing. Uh, globally, of course, there's budget differences, what different, different countries can afford. Um, and some of the main things that you'll see are the amount of services and, and how many patients there are in a bedroom. But those, those are really not critical factors um, because one consistently, that we're consistently seeing now are changing measurements of what efficiency means. 
it's not necessarily just the upfront cost, but it's looking over lifetime costs. So you're looking at durable, robust engineering in the buildings. You're looking at flexible design that can change over time. Um, and bringing those costs down, bringing staffing costs down with more efficient design, better logistics, uh, br using fewer consumables and storing less where possible, uh, and quicker turnaround times, getting better use out of the facilities that you have. Um, I don't know if anyone here ever watches Formula One, but uh, if you've ever seen the pit crews change a car in 15 seconds, all four tires and refuel and go. Um, operating theaters can be run like that, virtually. Utilization and also patient outcomes, uh, improved recovery times, improved outcomes, and, uh, and improved patient safety, reduction of injuries uh, of patients while they're in the hospital, and reduction of hospital-acquired infections, better infection control. All of these things can improve, not only improve your costs, but also you get more for your money. So, similarities that we're seeing around the world, uh, I mentioned earlier, technological change, more equipment to accommodate everywhere, which means more power, more data requirements, more cooling loads, and a lot of these older buildings just simply can't handle it, which is the reason that so many, so many institutions are making the choice to start with a clean slate. And also, uh, construction materials, we're seeing increasing use of steel because of the speed of construction. Um, and then modular interior construction. It's fast, it's easier to remodel, uh, and certainly it handles technology very well. You can pop a panel and get at whatever you need in the wall. So planning approaches. We'll deal with seven topics very quickly. I have to keep moving along here. Uh, Evidence-based design and best practices, lean process improvement and efficiency, uh, flexibility and adaptability for the facility design, integrated facilities and campuses, thinking about not just a standalone building, but the entire campus and how it works together and knits together. Uh, sustainability and resilience, and then technology, logistics, and moderni modernization. So we'll keep moving along here. <laughs> Evidence-based design and lean design are related, but they're different. They're both process-driven design. They both rely on evidence uh, and uh, scientific method and statistics, uh, but they're also experiential. How are people experiencing the space and what do they think? So evidence-based design, uh, the field of study emphasizing, as I said, statistical and but also experiential uh, uh, qualities. So it's quality as well as, as statistically measurable things. Uh, and there's all kinds of things that you can look at. You can look at patient safety, clinical outcomes, uh, patient experience, staff experience, which is important for staff uh, retention, uh, stress reduction, reduced medical errors, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Evidence-based design, uh, there have been many, many studies done that are pointing out factors that, le that lead to better patient outcomes and better processes and improvements. Uh, so this is just a chart that shows uh, you know, things that were tried and the green dots indicating where there were positive outcomes. We can always talk about those later. Uh, Evidence-based design. So here's one example. Uh, we're looking at just a patient room. This is a three-bed patient room. Uh, and we can talk about why that design is. But, uh, uh, and some of the evidence-based design pieces that we put into this. Reduced patient pain. Strong evidence shows that if you give people a view of nature, they have less experienced pain uh, sitting in their bed, it and it reduces their stress. The reduced stress means that they, act, they, they spend their body energy getting better rather than dealing with the stress. So you actually get patients released earlier and with better outcomes, simply by providing a window with a view of nature. Reduce patient stress. Um, bedrooms with and wards with smaller numbers of patients um, have less noise, which means, again, the patients have a more restful time while they're there, and they get better faster. Um, patient safety, reduced patient falls. Patient falls are a significant contributor to length longer patient stays in hospitals if they injure themselves. Putting, instead of having a, uh, a toilet down the hall, or a shower down the hall, if you provide it four meters away instead of 40 meters away, uh, 
there are 90% reduction in, in the chance of them injuring themselves. <coughs> uh, improved patient, staff, and family communication. Providing space for the family right in the room, uh, right next to the patient, but also providing enough space for the caregivers to get in and access the patient while the family are there. The family are there, but they're not in the way. So lean design, that's just one example uh, of experiences as well as statistics. Uh, lean design, uh, so this is really, it's, it, it came out of Toyota, uh, of all things. There's scientific management goes back a long way, but um, lean design, and it, it, they found that it applied to healthcare in many, many ways. So it's a long-term philosophy of continuous improvement, the idea that the right process will get the right results, uh, and adding value all, this, all the way along through every step, uh, and then continuous improvement, always trying to look for ways to make things better. Um, and it's about eliminating waste, whether that waste is defects and mistakes, uh, making too much of something, overproduction, waiting, wait times, reducing wait times, uh, non-utilized talent, transportation and motion, which is are very closely related, um, it, reducing inventory, and extra processing, working too much to make something making it simpler. Uh, so just looking at motion, uh, there's seven flows that you can think of in any given department or hospital. You have patients and visitors coming and going, caregivers, uh, medications that are being delivered and taken out by patients, supplies, information, equipment, and instruments. So looking at motion studies, you're looking at seven flows of in, in a healthcare facility. Uh, one example, this is just one department where you can trace uh, in different colors these different flows of things coming and going. If you think of those, this is called a spaghetti diagram. Uh, and you could, we used to do that with string, and uh, now you can do it with computers. But it, it still works. And um, if you think of these as rubber bands, and the further apart things are, the more tension there is, and the, what you want to do is, is move things closer together and reduce those travel distances. Examples of projects where we've done this process. Um, this was one we had in Park Nicolette uh, back in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, uh, where they wanted us to build them a, a, a whole new facility, twice as large. Uh, and instead, we ended up doing an interior remodel. We convinced them that that's all they needed. They were able to get 60% increase in patient throughput in the same facility with just a, an interior remodel. 65 added patients per day. The reduced staff walking uh, totaled 34 miles reduced per day, just walking back and forth. Um, fewer instruments processed, less inventory they had to stare. Okay. okay, this is another example where we looked at a surgical uh, uh, op an operating theater OT com complex, and we were able to get reductions in staff travel uh, through their, through their uh, everyday work um, by as much as 64%. 64% of time where they didn't have to spend just walking back and forth. And even though this project was done quite a while ago, elements of it still show up in our work today uh, in other projects with you know, variations, the theme and variations. Um, but the idea of how you lay out a surgical department for keeping, keeping clean and dirty things separated improving the infection control, but also minimizing travel distances for everyone involved. Uh, you can also look at this from the patient experience, patient experience mapping, where you look at where they go in a hospital to get something done, uh, and then considering what those patients need, depending on their age, their gender, uh, their background, uh, and what they would need at each step. Um, if they need to have a waiting area, do they have seating? Does the seating have a view? At the reception, is there you know, a countertop for them to fill out the forms, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through. Uh, so just one example of this. This is at uh, King Khalid Medical City. Uh, it was a 1,500 bed hospital with uh, super specialties, uh, dozens of super specialties and seven centers of excellence. Uh, huge facility, and so the outpatient uh, drop-off was along the south side, long airport-style drop-off, five separate entries, and each entry not only had signage, but a color-coding system 
Uh, and then the public art was also worked into that to identify where patients needed to go. So you come here to this pavilion, you're entering in. Um, these color codes, you'll know this is the public art. These are x-rays of plants, and each department has a different color and a different plant. So then you see this, you know you're at the right department. The red one, follow that, that's for cardiology. And you go in and over to the reception after information, and there's your cardiology department with the public art and the color and the system. Oh, going back one. The, the patients have as short and simple a route as possible once they leave the public zone. They go back straight in, straight to their room and out, and there's nursing along the way. The patient rooms themselves, standardized design, same-handed, minimizes medical errors, it minimizes training times. <coughs> Flexibility and adaptability, very quickly here. Um, designing the facility with infrastructure to allow for quick change and less expensive change when it happens. This is the uh, Mayo Clinic Gonda building, Leslie and Susan, Go Susan Gonda, it's their flagship building. Um, and you have inpatient and outpatient facilities here. The, let me switch this here. The public are at the center and you have departments on either side standardized modularized departments. Each floor is different with a different, uh, different department. But you have the in building infrastructure designed into specific zones and then the departments, very large departments, can be laid out in a very modular, linear fashion as efficiently as possible. Just okay. a small reminder, you... Sorry, here we go. Uh, right, so there you can see sort of the modular layouts of the departments. I think that's the main, the main point. And it's also easier to change. There's no shafts in the way, there's, there's uh, et cetera. Uh, vertical integration of a building is another piece. Um, centralizing your HVAC and your, your MEP into the building, uh, putting it on a single floor. You, you remove vibration, uh, noise, dirt, and dust from the other floors. Uh, and the maintenance team have 24-7 access to it so they can get to it and fix things faster. If you put that in the middle, you have your tower, patient tower up above. You have your diagnostics and treatment down below. The patient towers are, are designed for maximum surface area, maximum window, so that every patient room has a window. Uh, the podiums, on the other hand, can have very large floor plates accommodated. So the tower and the podium are separate with the MEP in the middle. You have your logistics, and, pub and support departments at the basement. Whoops, there we go, we're having it. Curtis, you'll just... Uh, I'm running out of time. Yep, yeah. okay. So, this is the basic diagram. Uh, these would be variations on this diagram where you can separate things out into separate buildings, in which case they may be linked horizontally rather than vertically, but many of these applications still apply. Uh, again, back to the KKMC, this is the project in Saudi, and you might say, what does, what does Saudi Arabia have that can teach India things? Well, in this project, the, the scale of what we're working on, uh, and if you, if you go from single bedrooms to multi-bedrooms, the, the heights of the towers will change, but that entire podium could remain the same uh, in terms of its ability to handle large numbers of the public. And that was that project. And then hybrid examples between the first and the second. Um, and this would be closer to what the projects we're doing today here in India. Um, this is one of the projects we're currently working on. Um, and again, that's just a demonstration of that wide podium with the towers on top. That, that, podium, that large podium roof then can become a roof garden, which again allows for those views of nature from the patient rooms. The roof garden also provides shade and it provides mass, which reduces the heating for the there's the rendering of what those gardens would look like. 
This is also space where the patients and the, their attendant family members can go, where they can get sunlight and some fresh air without having to go down into the hustle and bustle and busyness of the street. Whoops. There we go. Whoop. Yeah, so horizontal, next. I'm trying to move this along here. I just request you to kindly wind up, please. I'm winding, yes. Okay, so horizontal integration, just like with the vertical, you can do that with the horizontal. Uh, separating out departments uh, in, into related specialties into the blocks, but also allowing more daylight into those blocks. Having utility buildings separated, but then the whole facility is linked together by connecting bridges that are fully air conditioned for the staff and for the public. And for the logistics, connecting clean and sep separate clean and dirty corridors in the basements, connecting them all together into basically what's a mega structure. So that's uh, just one example. Uh, and then in terms of sustainability uh, for transportation, uh, limiting where the, the vehicles, uh, motor vehicles can go uh, within a campus to say the perimeter, which allows for a robust network of pedestrian and bicycle path pathways through the middle of the campus. Uh, this is an enclosed uh, skywalk that we're working on that would connect um, the metro station to the large OPD clinics on the other side of the campus. Easy, easy wayfinding, 100% accessible with elevators and escalators and travelators to speed people on their way as comfortably as possible. Green spaces in the campus at multiple levels. Again, we talked about the, the roof gardens as well as um, using the green space to define the different areas, functional areas of, of a campus, the academic, the medical, the housing. So that's, again, sustainability, increasing the amount of green space by being able to build taller, uh, increasing the overall green space, which lowers the heat island effect, produces more thermal comfort outdoors, encouraging people to walk or bicycle in, instead of take their cars. So again, roof gardens, uh, water management, ETP, STP, and WTP on the site uh, that allows for zero discharge, zero discharge, uh, rainwater recycling, solar power. In this case, uh, we're able to provide 5% of our power just from the taller rooftops in the, in the campus. Uh, and the facades, studying daylight to maximize daylight while minimizing the heat gain. Uh, in the building and reducing your overall energy costs. Also studying wind uh, and so trying to maximize thermal comfort without creating um, wind tunnels. And thinking of the building as an integrated system of systems. Finally, technology, robust and future-proofed, yes. Uh, including district cooling, larger plants which have a longer lifespan, give you the efficiencies of scale uh, to, to do it, what you want to do with fewer staff. Uh, and then, of course, data. And the one thing I'll just close with on the data is that data will change everything. If you, if you don't have the physical handoff of your paper files from, recept from record keeping to reception to a nurse to a doctor and then back again, it changes how your clinics can be laid out. And also that information being provided in real time with imaging in a surgical department, in an operating theater, will change how both of those departments work. And finally, logistics, thinking about logistics. We've done some military hospitals, and those fellows certainly understood logistics very well. Um, but being able to do that on a large-scale medical facility, or even a smaller-scale medical facility, and making these things as efficient as possible, and sometimes a little bit of, a little bit of cost can reduce the amount of building that you need. Um, if you have if you have a loading dock with a uh, with a loading dock leveler, so you can have roll on roll off with pallets. You don't have to have people carrying things one at a time. You will massively speed up the time that, uh, that shorten the time the trucks have to be there. You can get more trucks per dock, fewer docks, saving overall cost on the amount of building that you need. Very large, very you know, engineering such as proton beam therapy. Uh, this, this is basically a therapy that takes an entire building. And then 3D modeling, BIM, B 
building information modeling, 3D modeling, but it's also information management. Um, and being able to design an entire campus, this is 1.4 million square meters, in 3D, understanding all the parts and components and how they go together. Uh, and making sure that they're coordinated and work before the contractor ever comes on board. Uh, facilities management managers are also very interested in having these models uh, for their own use. And that wraps it up. Pardon me for going just a little bit long. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, we'll have the question and answers at the end of the, the three end. speakers. Yeah. Uh, please have a seat. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, very enlightening talk. You have given a great glimpse into the global trends and uh, sort of uh, uh, tagged the safe and sustainable hospitals to you know what uh, was presented in your talk. So thanks for highlighting the importance of services, the importance of efficiency, cost, you know, patient-centric design, quality, and patient safety, of course. Ultimately, the aim to create a healing environment for the patient. Thank you so much for your talk, and I would invite uh, uh, Dr. S.K.M. Rao to please deliver his talk. you will have a maximum 15 minutes I'll just give you a short warning three minutes short into your time yeah. thank you <laughs> and uh, thank you. Yeah, over to you. let me start uh, with uh, thanking dr. Jawahar and Ames Bhuneshwar team and AHA uh, for giving me this opportunity to present some of the experiences. I am not an architect as all of you know. I am a hospital administrator and have been managing uh, various hospitals. Uh, today's uh, topic for me uh, is uh, the practical experiences which we got during the pandemic and post pandemic what uh, changes we should make in our hospitals. That is a my uh, short talk. Uh, okay, so uh, during these two waves of experience, why I am saying two waves because they were really severe waves, third, fourth and all are going on and rather it has become endemic now. But uh, these two waves taught us many things and I personally have an experience of uh, handling 7,500 inpatients and m multiple outpatients in terms of hospital administration and not as a uh, you know clinician but uh, that has taught us a uh, lot of uh, things like all of you are aware we all did this because smaller hospitals very small uh, you know layouts and multiple hospitals with 50 beds 100 beds 150 beds in the chain so we have to manage with all these aspects which are ad hoc these are all ad hoc things uh, which happened, all of you are aware. Then we also had these experimentation in terms of technology, uh, in terms of doing triage and various things uh, and uh, trying to manage things, uh, keeping in mind the COVID nature. Then also uh, we've had uh, a lesson, uh, rather all of us have been taught about uh, triage rooms, isolation rooms in ER also, but it was never followed because of constraints of money and constraints of layout, constraint of space, so on and so forth. But perforce we had to create this, though they may not be typically negative isolation rooms, but we had to create uh, these spaces, whether it was possible in the layout or not, we had perforcely, perforce we had to do. Uh, DRDO, of course, all of us are aware DRDO helped us in uh, uh, Gujarat government also and many other uh, governments and uh, opened up uh, the hospitals which were independent and they were now they lie defunct or rather they have been closed down. <coughs> operation theatre again uh, operation theatre and labour room all of us have faced this. They once uh, the first wave itself we were totally unprepared and we started getting 
covid positive labor cases covid positive operations and being a commercial uh, corporate and private hospitals you can't refuse you tend to get them into your fold there have been many guidelines which have come up all of you are aware about negative uh, operation theaters negative pressure operation theaters and then we did all sorts of experimentation we blocked the uh, uh, you know uh, inflows and tried to uh, increase the outflows etc but i think old concept which all of us have learned to have a septic ot really you know helped us uh, uh, literally in terms of doing uh, labor room as well as a separate ot you can see the corridor which is there on the right hand side we had this uh, septic ot so we could manage that in septic ot without changing much of things but another thing i just wanted to bring out to the notice of everyone and especially the hospital administrators uh, we do uh, have bigger cost in having a separate ahu uh, for every area of the operation theater as well as icu but definitely it was very very helpful for all of us uh, during the pandemic because we could do changes very quickly into the air handling system and uh, get going okay same uh, same thing about uh, icus also cubicle icus very very few uh, cubicle icus you will find in private sector especially in the smaller nursing homes smaller uh, hospitals and uh, uh, these definitely were handy uh, the cubicle ones but uh, uh, you know uh, what we did actually is that the entire bank of icus were converted into negative uh, pressure in terms of creating just a simple exhaust by using 3 hp motor and putting that uh, exhaust on the top of the terrace quickly through our engineering team uh, and that served us a lot uh, in terms of icu care because as you know in second wave especially it, we got hit so much uh, for the icu beds and oxygen beds all of you are aware then what are the uh, various other things which i just mentioned triage rooms fever clinics covid non covid areas Uh, in the er separate entry exits donning areas doffing areas separate ot negative pressure all of you are aware about uh, these aspects though for the students probably those who have faced directly they are all aware about this dialysis uh, areas or dialysis ro water points was again a very big problematic areas as you know the 10% 10 to 15% of our patients uh, landed up in renal failure and uh, uh, all of them especially in the first wave more so and in the second wave mostly uh, there were uh, respiratory issues uh, in terms of oxygen and uh, oxygen lines so both of these things are very very important uh, in terms of uh, ro points and oxygen points so this is again a lesson for all of us to create these uh, modules throughout the hospital and uh, that is how we can easily uh, what uh, my previous speaker was mentioning about flexibility and expandability that is only possible if the services fetch up with these if you want a patient to be dialyzed when it is isolated also then you better have uh, these lines all over and mind you i just wanted to point out again here that we keep on talking about the expenditure it was a minimal expenditure uh, and i can assure you that very much affordable and within the uh, within that cycle within that wave itself we could recover entire money whatever we spent on these extra lines and extra uh, uh, oxygen points etc very very easily done and uh, faster uh, we could move uh, with more patients oxygen generation plant again a word about it quickly because i have very less time so in the oxygen generation plant uh, i wanted to bring out see people keep on donating this oxygen generation plant uh, etc but uh, operational costs are very high sir operational cost in terms of electricity expenditure we found that it was very very high we started uh, immediately started relying back on the liquid oxygen though there was a temporary shortage but uh, the best uh, from the hospital administrator's angle uh, it is not very useful to have huge uh, oxygen generation plants uh, and now the nmc has also mci nmc whatever we may, we may call uh, those people also have made it compulsory but uh, many of us have got this in donation and they are now lying defunct what elements of design is going to stay now this is the one more question before i wind up uh, so let us look at it i have already said about the flexibility and expandability 
which my previous speaker also has brought out so uh, this digital aspect digital revolution everybody is aware keep uh, people keep on talking there are conferences after conferences which happened after covid that uh, this is going to be a revolution etc on ground i think we have just moved around 10% i would say as compared to what whatever uh, people are saying a main thing about the teleconsultation etc platforms have come up the laws have been passed and uh, many things have happened but on ground the practice continues to be uh, same post covid uh, that you know you are face to face more comfortable with the patients but definitely there is a scope of cutting down on registration counters uh, through all these aspects billing counters uh, by uh, uh, opening up the payment gateways etc so this is just uh, all of us are aware but just wanted to highlight this aspect about teleconsultation and various other aspects of we uh, also in the second wave i happen to work in a cancer hospital hospital also where uh, they don't have much expertise on the icu aspects which is there in the multi speciality hospital so we had to partly rely on tele icu services also and uh, which really helped us uh, giving an expert advice especially when the complications started more and more complications happened so uh, flexibility my previous speaker i don't want to go into details these are all golden rules and which we keep on defying because our hospitals are created based on the spaces which we get this much land is available you please do whatever you want to you know 400 beds 500 beds we just uh, increase just like that within no time and uh, land up in various problems service related problems so definitely these uh, uh, principles which are given in our books but uh, uh, and we also uh, you know always say these in our conferences but on ground these this does not happen this again same thing my previous speaker already brought out about identical aspects of ot icus and uh, various inpatient rooms so let us skip that because of lack of time again uh, common problem areas which all of us face but never say anything about it never do anything about it and uh, keep on cribbing and when you uh, plan a new project again those problems again come up i i you know sort of analyze these things and uh, came to conclusion that our architects as well as various our owners and uh, those who have the money are not adequately briefed on these aspects they tend to cut corners where they are not supposed to cut corners especially storage spaces space for doctors room space for nurses room where that is how uh, some of them could be adjusted donning areas doffing areas where they came out they came out in the corridor you blocked the corridors and you know uh, did all these things during covid but it's always good to plan these areas pantry staff dining areas adequate storage areas again most problematic areas uh, in my entire career is storage areas storage areas whether they are in operation theater storage areas in uh, icus and what have you so many uh, areas always lack storage and as hospital grows uh, as the patient strength grows occupancy grows these problems become more and more uh, as you will realize okay again stuck <laughs> okay sorry so this is just an example again common uh, issues like this you can see uh, on your uh, screen uh, about uh, storage being done within the room itself icu room getting blocked because of uh, various storage issues we, i have also given example of a wrong door of the toilet uh because we can't take a patient there because if there are twin patients then again those patients also crib though we are always adjust but then satisfaction goes down okay again uh, circulation related problems narrow corridors all of us have faced they are never 2.4 meters so to say because every time there is a constraint of space double loading is there double loading of room is there and you have no choice because owner is telling you that okay uh, i have this much space only boss you have please adjust because that much revenue also is needed door opening on wrong side i have already said non availability of bed lifts service lifts not planned uh, dirty utility areas 
uh, again very very less dirty utility areas and uh, storage i have already said another problem uh, because of accreditation needs most of the hospitals are being retrofitted i will say because accreditation dictates you certain things and especially these fire fighting uh, those old buildings all of them uh, had to be uh, uh, retrofitted for something or the other whether it is creating exhaust or uh, creating exhaust in the staircases or fire dampers and so on so forth so many things okay so again uh, this i i think i'll just uh, you know skip this because this has been covered earlier also but one particular aspect which i would like to say in modern era counseling rooms because of this fights and violence which is happening in the hospitals non communication communication aspects between patients doctors and multi speciality so multi speciality counseling uh, we have been saying this in accreditation standards also but on ground you will find that there is hardly any space for counseling um, uh, near ot near icus and uh, near various uh, critical areas uh, in even in the er even in the emergency room you need uh, counseling uh, areas yeah five minutes are remaining i was told okay so uh, ramps etc i think those are uh, routine things many other things uh, like already my previous speaker has said about the cutting down the distances uh, not to criss cross between from in patient areas to out patient areas uh, not to criss cross uh, pathways of morgue etc uh, dead bodies then various uh, service elevators many times you will find that the uh, because of lack of space or poor designing the waste disposal areas or waste disposal routes are same to what uh, our staff routes are and this uh, this came handy definitely during uh, our covid but definitely we need uh, this separate separate routes other things have been already covered uh, in the previous presentation about the aesthetic considerations especially about the light in the icu again a problematic area but due to layout of the buildings and layout of the land itself it may not be possible but we should try and create if not natural light uh, if not natural ambience then at least the artificial ambience should be created some of them have tried actually in the private nursing homes also efficiency again the same similar uh, thing has been i think i will just skip this but uh, uh, my slides are also little crowded so uh, okay so this again patient safety already highlighted by previous speaker but this is becoming more and more important uh, to incorporate in the design and it will continue it was very very relevant during pandemic also and it will continue to be relevant ahead differently abled okay fire now fire is a is a big issue uh, i think uh, i go to multiple hospitals for doing nabh uh, uh, assessments and i find that most of the difficult areas which they find for closure are fire safety norms fire safety norms though uh, due to accreditation what has happened is most of the times even if the fire noc is there people uh, do uh, find that uh, it is very very uh, difficult to comply with 2016 nbc guidelines there are multiple uh, aspects of it um, and also people criticize that jci looks into it and nabh doesn't look into it and so on so forth there are many multiple issues in the fire safety uh, guidelines which i think one must do it in the beginning itself if not in the beginning at least some retrofitting arrangements must be done uh, to comply with this i personally experienced this during due diligence by a multinational uh, firm for the existing hospital chain uh, they made sure that they uh, you know comply they make uh, the hospitals comply with this especially this compartmentalization of uh, various areas so th that's why i thought i must highlight these issues all of you are aware but, uh, these are given in the these are given in the books these are given in the guidelines nbc guidelines but uh, these are very very important from practical point of view thank you uh, this was in short but i think <laughs> there's a, a scope for uh, on each slide but due to shortage of time i think 
uh, I will cut down that and uh, conclude my talk. And of course, you are most welcome to uh, you know ask questions post the entire session is over. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rao. You have covered the uh, topic very well, particularly that you highlighted the problems which we are facing as administrators and the areas which are often forgotten. Now I will request Colonel Shukla to deliver his talk. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Before uh, they flash my presentation, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Jawar and General Behra, sir, to have uh, given me this opportunity uh, to deliver this talk in front of my most uh, revered gurus and the doyens of hospital administrators. So, uh, uh, Talking about uh, green hospitals and the design aspects related to that, I think this is one of the topics uh, most uh, suitable and most aligned with the uh, overall theme of uh, this conference, that is sustainable hospitals. So this uh, shall be my scheme of presentations. Uh, we are all uh, well aware of the deteriorating health of our environment, which is a, a really painful uh, reality and it is becoming more and more unsustainable for the human existence and uh, having a direct bearing on the human health. The climate change, the uh, chemical contamination of our environment, and the uh, uh, unsustainable resource usage is all exacerbating the situations. Healthcare organizations, per se, are one, uh, they consume a very large amount of resources for construction as well as op their operation. They are the healthcare operations of organizations of today, they are very complex establishments. They employ highly sophisticated technology, use a large amount of electricity, and they also generate a very vast array of waste, which itself has become a very uh, issue of major public health concern. So uh, in the uh, NHS, uh, uh, one of the studies uh, shows that they are responsible for almost a quarter of the total public sector emissions. Almost a quarter of the total emissions taking place in the public sector is by the healthcare organizations of the NHS. India, a vast uh, country with a very large population. Uh, this is the, uh, we have approximately 1.18 lakh uh, beds. And our country, uh, CPCB estimates that uh, the country is generating 1.48 million tons of healthcare waste per year. A uh, study uh, taken by uh, Energy Conservation Building Code uh, showed uh, that uh, uh, we have a potential to conserve almost 42% of the energy consumed by implementation of uh, various energy efficient measures. And a, a report by uh, CII showed that almost 60% of their our healthcare uh, uh, organizations and hospitals do not meet the minimum criteria for energy performance index, which they say is, uh, should be approximately 200 kilowatt hours per square meter per hour. Our hospitals are expending 380 kilowatt per hour per square meter per year. The uh, uh, energy consumed by the hospitals, this is the breakdown of that uh, by the same study. And it shows, as you can see on the slide, is that uh, almost 50 to 60 percent, various studies in various parts of the world have shown the same figures, results, that is uh, 50 to 60 percent of the energy consumed in the hospitals is on account of HVAC. So uh, coming to the uh, overall theme, that is uh, what is uh, this uh, whole uh, new concept of uh, green building or green hospitals. So uh, various authors have defined it in various ways, but all of them uh, they agree that they are sustainable, they are environmental friendly, they use, uh, they try to use uh, renewable resources, they try to reduce waste by implementing green practices and enhance, which ultimately enhances the patient well-being. They also uh, rely on the uh, principles of uh, three R's, that is reduce, reuse and recycle. They are innovative and they also try to reduce their uh, carbon footprint. Although in uh, these uh, green hospitals, the initial cost of construction is uh, higher, but in the long term, due to uh, lower operational cost, they tend to balance out the cost. So these, the advantages of green hospitals are that they uh, lead to reduction in the hospital stays, there is faster recovery rates, there is reduction in the patient uh, requirement of the pain medications, as Mr. Curtis had already brought out, there is also reduction in the secondary infection rates. 
So uh, the advantages of uh, the uh, healthcare structures uh, as per the green norms, uh, as already mentioned, is uh, there's faster recovery times. They also re uh, reduce uh, the sick building syndrome, that is uh, feeling of uh, uh, not being patient, uh, not feeling well uh, amongst the staff as well as the patients. Uh, it also reduces the stress level in the health workers, which improves the quality of care. The, uh, the uh, employees are more motivated. Uh, there's also a reduction in the operation cost and uh, the, uh, by there's also optimum utilization of the power as well as uh, waste. But uh, uh, if everything is so good, why are we not using uh, or why are not all our hospitals uh, uh, green? So the impediments to the green hospitals are that, first of all, in hospitals, we are uh, aware that they are complex establishments. We need to have system redundancies in place. Uh, life and limb situation uh, uh, it needs to be preserved. There are a lot of regulatory compliances as uh, uh, Kalan Rao also uh, already mentioned. Hospitals are working 24 by 7. There are numerous infection control protocols which have to be adhered to. The ventilation rates to be maintained in ICUs and OTs. Various accreditation li licensing demands. So the, our hospitals are huge energy guzzlers because we all want central air conditioning in all our modern hospitals. The water use almost 500 liters of water per bed per patient. There's a high volume of uh, waste being generated, uh, normal waste as well as the biomedical waste, a large amounts of hazardous chemicals being used for infection control or, or for the housekeeping or in the laboratories or for research purposes. And although over the overall uh, the building envelope uh, remains the same, but we tend to do a lot of uh, interior renovations, which also leads to more uh, resource consumption. So the elements of the green hospitals are that, uh, firstly, they should be uh, try to uh, conserve energy. There are a lot of design elements which can be used to make hospitals green. They should be looking at uh, alternative means of energy generation, uh, looking at uh, waste management and water conservation as already brought out by the earlier speakers. So the design consideration for the green hospitals, the uh, hospitals have uh, various uh, phases in their life cycle. And uh, the largest, one of the largest amounts of uh, uh, energy or the uh, resources are used during the construction phase, which uh, should be targeted for making the hospitals green. And uh, so also has been the uh, major thrust aspect by the various green rating agencies. So this is uh, uh, the various building phases which has been described by various authors. That is the pre-building phase, the building phase, and the post-building phase. So we'll uh, quickly go through uh, all of them. So in the pre-building phase, the first uh, aspect uh, relates to the appropriate site selection. So uh, uh, the location of the building, it determines the uh, microclimatic conditions, which also affects, which includes the uh, sun radiation, which you are receiving, the air temperature, the circulation, humidity, which all affects the energy cost. And as mentioned, that uh, 50 to 60 percent is uh, of the energy consumption is on account of the HVAC. The site of the building and the distance between other buildings also affects the radiation which the hospital receives and the air which is circulating around the hospital. So in, uh, if you are located in a uh, colder country, uh, should be avoiding the uh, valleys or the top of the hills. So uh, should be ideally located, uh, provided the, uh, uh, the area permits you, it should be located on the uh, slopes rather than uh, the valleys itself. The topography of the location of the buildings, uh, which uh, affects the angle of incidence of the solar radiation, which uh, uh, again has great implications as regards the use of daylight and the natural ventilation, and the solar radiation the uh, healthcare or the hospital receives. Traditionally, it is uh, said that the south slope is uh, better suited. Uh, the uh, should be looking towards uh, siting the uh, buildings uh, in a southeast facing direction, so you avoid the uh, harsh uh, summers, harsh uh, uh, sunlight during the uh, afternoon hours. The, uh, the, uh, during the design process, it is also important that you look at the uh, building as a whole with its environment as a system-wide study. And uh, the position and distance with the other buildings in the environment should also be looked at, which ultimately affects the uh, solar energy and the wind direction and the speed which affects the uh, ventilation in the building itself. So the orientation and positioning of the buildings as uh, we had just discussed. The shape of the building is also very important. Uh, the uh, heat loss of the bend of the building uh, rises or declines depending on the uh, surface area upon volume. So uh, a compact form in cold areas will minimize the heat loss. In hot and dry climates, again, uh, compact forms are uh, more suitable. Or you can also look at having courtyards. Uh, in hot and humid uh, uh, air climate regions like our country, you should be looking at more uh, long and thin forms whose long side is oriented towards along with the direction of the prevailing wind as well as the direction of the sun. In mild climates, again, compact forms are more suitable. 
So uh, this is, these are the various uh, uh, ways in which uh, uh, you can utilize uh, the prevailing wind direction and uh, minimize the uh, radiation which is coming on the hospitals because uh, in, a, in a hot country like ours, we are looking more at minimizing the solar radiation coming on our hospitals. Uh, the, build, uh, the building plan uh, also has uh, great implications as regards the energy consumption by the hospitals. A simple plan is always more suitable. So in the uh, building design itself, uh, when we are looking at uh, uh, where the various facilities uh, should be sited, uh, a stratification of the zoning can be done, uh, so uh, which uh, uh, ensures that the uh, uh, areas or the uh, departments or the centers which uh, generate a lot of noise or which require a lot of light and heating need, they are sited towards the exterior of the building. Areas with uh, more uh, users which are used throughout should also, uh, they, it is said that uh, should be sited on the uh, southerly direction. Now coming to the building envelope. The building envelope uh, includes your, uh, the walls, the roof, the ceiling, the ground, the doors. And uh, because ultimately uh, they, are, uh, they have a vital impact on the energy consumption, they act as a filter between the indoor and the outdoor uh, conditions. And the uh, cost of the building envelope consumes almost 50 to 40% of the total constructional cost. But if it is uh, used in a sustainable manner or these uh, aspects are uh, used sustainably, it can contribute to the life cycle cost which uh, leads in almost 60% reduction in the energy cost. So uh, the uh, uh, first part that is the outer walls, the uh, thermal and the uh, uh, various other characteristics of the outer walls, are, uh, they are related to the building items constituting them. You must have heard that uh, the uh, government of India has made it uh, mandatory uh, for the use of fly ash bricks in the highways and the uh, uh, and it has also been made mandatory that if there's a uh, fly ash brick plant or a cement plant uh, within 200, uh, 300 uh, uh, kilometers, then it is, uh, they are supposed to be using this. Uh, they are also not as expensive and not as, uh, uh, they are more environmental friendly as the clay bricks which we have been traditionally using. The uh, roofs also, they need to be designed to uh, suit these climate, uh, climatic conditions. So uh, in a uh, maybe a cold climatic zone, we have uh, the uh, sloping or gradient roofs. In a hot country like ours, uh, a flat roof is probably more preferred. Uh, this uh, Mr. Curtis has already uh, discussed uh, the green roofs, which uh, again substantially reduce the HVAC uh, load, also uh, help in reduction of the pollutants. And although they, the initial cost of uh, construction may be higher, this may be some maintenance cost also, but it significantly reduces the HVAC cost of the hospital. The windows, again, uh, they are the uh, act as a major filter, allow the sunlight to come in, uh, and uh, they also, uh, uh, if used appropriately, they can also uh, lead to reduction in the HVAC load in the hospitals. So various studies have uh, shown that uh, the, uh, a large window uh, pro uh, allows more in-light ventilation. There are a lot of other things which have been incorporated, uh, like the low e-glass coatings, gas fills, weather stripping. The, uh, also, it is important that we use local materials and recycled resources uh, in our uh, hospitals, which uh, make it uh, more uh, uh, environmental friendly. The landscape design also can be used uh, to ensure that uh, the uh, hospital is oriented along the wind direction, which leads to more ventilation. So these are various kinds of energy efficient landscape design. Uh, there's, uh, uh, as uh, the green roof, we also have the concept of uh, green walls now. And uh, uh, this has al already been discussed, uh, the uh, use of sunlight uh, for heating as well as for uh, uh, allowing the natural sunlight to enter our hospitals. So these are various other uh, uh, models of uh, use of uh, renewable energy resources. A uh, lot of uh, uh, work is being done and a lot of hospitals have uh, started uh, using photovoltaic panels which are integrated into the buildings for heating, uh, electricity generation, and uh, now people are also looking at the wind turbines which have been integrated into the buildings. Natural uh, lighting, a lot of has already been said. The uh, hospitals uh, should also be looking at uh, more energy efficient uh, 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 building systems. So pre-cast construction systems uh, you know, which uh, allow modular uh, building uh, designs are also being looked at. So uh, this has already been discussed, uh, the uh, HVAC, because they are the major components of uh, the energy consumption of the hospitals. So we, uh, it is very um, important that we select the appropriate HVAC systems. So the gas-based uh, vapor absorption system, which uses only demineralized water and lithium bromide, uh, and uh, it is CFC-free, uh, it is requires very little maintenance on operating cost, are most suitable. Uh, water uh, cooled screw chillers are also uh, good. They are l less costly in the initial cost is less as compared to the uh, these uh, the earlier one, the gas based reserve option system. Both of them can be looked at. 
the other uh, means for sustainable designs is that uh, we should be looking at uh, the uh, energy efficient uh, LED bulbs, uh, both in the general areas as well in the operation theaters, lighting controls, uh, the water conservations uh, through use of sensor based wash basins, urinals. Uh, uh, the boilers can be uh, uh, made functional by the use of solar energy and utilization of heat from the AC plants can also be used for the uh, running or the operations of the boilers. And building management systems which help in optimizing the consumption of electricity in various parts the, as well as the uh, lighting uh, can also be, uh, should be looked at. The other uh, aspects, uh, Minister Custis has already discussed, the rainwater har harvesting systems. We should also be looking at uh, recycling of the grey water for irrigation purposes, effluent treatment plants, and reducing the transportation costs by effective siting and use of uh, public transportation systems for our hospitals. So uh, uh, all this is uh, good for uh, the uh, new and upcoming hospitals. What can the existing hospitals do? So uh, the existing hospital should also be, uh, like if they want to uh, reduce their carbon footprint, become more environment friendly and sustainable, they can use energy efficient HVAC systems, they can use energy efficient LEDs, lighting systems and electrical uh, appliances, better landscaping and green roofing should be looked at, renewable energy resources in terms of solar vote photovoltaic panels should be looked at, and water conservations including rainwater harvesting which has been man made mandatory in many big cities by the government should be looked at, building management systems will be again a great uh, boon shot in the arm for uh, uh, green uh, hospitals. So finally to conclude, I think uh, in today's uh, age and time, uh, going green is no longer a choice but rather a necessity. Greens, uh, uh, being green does not mean, uh, it uh, means that we are more efficient and uh, there is lesser operational cost. The healthcare operations organization can exploit these uh, green eatings for the, their image building also, that they can uh, tell the world that they are environmental friendly. Uh, ideally, we should be looking at uh, using specialized consultants for uh, all these uh, things. And uh, I leave it to the House to think that uh, whether we uh, require more stringent regulations to ensure that the hospitals uh, be more green in their outlook. Thank you and Jai Hind.